All right, the awkward silence has started in the room, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Leslie Dunlap. I am the founder of Dunlap Consulting, which uh, is focused on consumer protection issues in the tech space, in particular privacy, so it's a great privilege for me to be with this wonderful panel of experts uh, in this area. And uh, we have here, starting at the end and then going through just real quickly, um, Daniel Castro, who has been writing on privacy and other consumer protection issues related to the internet for many, many years. Um, and is, I guess, affiliations would be good with ITIF, the Information Technology um, Industry Foundation, right? In Innovation Foundation, sorry about that. Um, Michelle Demoy, who is now at the Center for Democracy and Technology with a long um, pedigree in working at early startups like Lookout that did marketing analytics, um, all the way in through um, many uh, causes for helping people use online services to market their um, particular backgrounds. Um, that's more like... Um, I'm not. <laughs> uh, also on the board of Future Privacy Forum, and uh, a lot of nonprofits. Yeah, I was gonna. Say, I was gonna try to list them all, and that doesn't make a lot of sense. The cam campaign for tobacco-free kids, the Wilderness Society. So she has, uh, even though she's doing the online marketing piece of it, a strong pedigree in the um, advocacy community, and then most recently was with Consumer Action, uh, fighting for consumers on privacy issues, and now is extending that with the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, Anne Toth who is at Slack Technologies. She's the Vice President for uh, Policy and Compliance Strategy. She, has, uh, she ran privacy for Google Plus. She had many years uh, at Yahoo as a Chief Trust Officer and uh, ran online safety and advertising policy as well. And has uh, also founded her own company at one point called Privacy Works and worked with many uh, various different startups on privacy compliance issues. So she's our girl from Silicon Valley. Um, Lee Rainey has a long and august career at uh, the Pew Trust. Um, and uh, he will be giving us a, a little bit of information on new, uh, new findings that they've come out with. Uh, but he also has a, a strong background in journalism and was at US News and World Report before that. So 15 years as the director of internet um, science and technology at the Pew Research Center is quite the pedigree. But even before that, he was very involved in, in uh, journalism and, and uh, data. Issues and then John Verdi uh, with NTIA has uh, a long history in privacy as well. Was with uh, Epic and has been running the multi-stakeholder process for um, the Department of Commerce. So. Uh, Without further ado, I think we've been hearing a lot about privacy already today. We heard about it from Edith Ramirez, and early on we, we got some great examples of what's going on at C CEA with the Internet of Things and how people are, are wearing fertility bands and um, have their refrigerators programmed from anywhere in the world. And the Internet of Things is definitely one of the topics we're going to cover. We also um, know that consumer attitudes have been changing over time. Uh, especially because of all the data breaches we've seen. So data breach is an issue, but we're really going to focus um, in large part on commercial privacy, which may be a little bit different from traditional personally identifiable information. So um, we've got, I want to start really with Lee and give him the opportunity to, to give us some information about consumer attitudes and the new uh, findings they have. Thanks, Leslie. It's an honor to be here, and um, it, it's especially an honor to try to explain the compli complicated, messy, imprecise way Americans think and talk about privacy when they talk to us in our surveys and, and focus groups. Uh, the modern condition is one that Dana Boyd has wonderfully described as public by default, private by effort. It's a switch in human uh, connection and human identity that has been accelerating in the past 20 years. And in our work, there are sort of six big things that we learn uh, from our research and that have been evolving over time. 
The first is Americans do not think of privacy as a binary thing. It's not an on-off switch. It's something that they want to modulate uh, their anonymity as well as their public lists, depending on the conditions and the context and the circumstances that they find themselves in. The second is that personal control and personal agency matters a lot to them. Whatever is happening to them, and they don't necessarily know all that's happening to them, their strong preference is to know and to be able to adjust their circumstances to what's happening as well as to control how their data are used once uh, they're collected. They understand that trade-offs are part of the bargain. Uh, that they're not necessarily um, always thinking about privacy or disclosure. They're tr trying to think about the value proposition that they're getting in. Sometimes it's related to security. A lot of times it's related to convenience and efficiency and other things that they hold as valuable or even more so than particular pieces of their information. Uh, the fourth thing is just to emphasize, and I don't need to say much more about it, other than it's, it pushes back against the popular notion. The young are actually more tuned into network privacy and network identity than the old are. This is not a generation of, of narcissists that we've never seen before, or privacy in different people. They're actually very careful about reputation management and knowing what's going on, even as they're in the process of sharing more than their elders are. A surprising thing in our most recent findings is that people know they don't know what's going on, and that's what spooks them, uh, that they have a sense that both the security breaches as well as the, the, the different ways data can be collected uh, as they are shedding it or as they are advertently uh, letting it go. They're just not sure anymore about what's happening to it, and that is making them crazy. So that means the final point is they're losing a bit of trust, particularly in the commercial entities that are in charge of keeping their data and being good stewards about it. Just a few little stats here, because no pew presentation is complete without them. Um, the one that the president cited when he went to the Federal Tra Trade Commission about 10 days ago was that 91% of Americans agree or strongly agree that, the, that people have lost control of their personal information in commercial contexts. Um, when you asked him about a typical day, how much control do you have over the information that, um, that is being captured about you or that you are, are letting go, only half say that they have a sense that they can control it and they can adjust the dial the way they want to. 86% um, of internet users have tried to be anonymous online, but 51% say it's impossible to be anonymous online. This is an element of how they um, are losing control of things. The new stuff that we have, that we haven't even actually put out in a report yet, but um, we're beginning to talk about it because it's so powerful, is that many uh, people are talking about their lack of faith in institutions to protect the data that they are giving up. So at the bottom of the list, three quarters of folks say that they have no faith that online advertisers will be able to keep custody of the data in a safe way. 46% uh, say that uh, credit card companies, uh, even those that are terribly, terribly vigilant and have very sophisticated systems, are in control of it. And there are a whole host of other companies that we asked about in between that there, there is this systemic loss of confidence that institutions are doing a good job of being data stewards. And the final one I'll just put out because it's so central to the conversations at the, uh, at the um, State of the Net conference is that most people now think that they need more laws to protect uh, what's going on because this current situation, they feel themselves deficient in it. They don't necessarily know all they want to do. They want to do more. They don't really have, feel like they have the tools to do it. But three quarters say that there should be better and tighter laws uh, governing this arena because they, it just feels, again, out of control to them. So, Lee, what do you think that means for the government and for companies who are trying to build that trust? Does it mean that we absolutely need more laws? Do, is there any specification on what kinds of laws? Um, do we need incremental improvements? What's your view yeah, on that? Um, this is sort of a generalized feeling rather than a specific one. We haven't yet tested specific uh, solutions yet. It's actually going to be in our next survey on these things. But I'm pretty confident that if you just framed uh, a simple question as, do you, would you think of the right to privacy or the right to forget would be uh, something that you'd like in this country, the vast majority of Americans would probably say so in that context um, free kind of uh, situation. Uh, if you ask them about some of the, the downside of that, they might pull back on their ideas, but there are a whole host of ways that they probably think that, that the laws can be better. Just having clearer rules of the road, particularly not so much with the capture of data in the first place, but how it's kept and, and aggregated in databases would be something they'd probably be really interested in. And it probably is, you know, if you frame it as incremental or radical, they'd, they'd say something pretty dramatically better uh, would, be, would make them happier.
Okay. So Daniel, um, do you agree with that? You've done a lot of writing over time about the Internet of Things, about um, how different privacy frameworks affect innovation. What do you think will happen to innovation if we are moving in the direction of more legislation? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, it, it's really interesting to hear all the, the points from uh, Pew about consumer attitudes. Um, it's something that you know, follow a lot um, over time. And consumer attitudes are a very, I think, useful um, data point. But it's important to remember they don't tell the entire story. Uh, I'm re always reminded of the Steve Jobs quote here about um, you know, a lot of times people don't know what they want. Um, until after you show it to them. And he was talking about you know, the iPod and uh, the iPad and all these different innovations he came up with. And I think policymakers need to keep that in mind as well. Um, they might not be as visionary as Steve Jobs and maybe it's too much to ask them to be, uh, but I think it's something to aspire to. And I, this is really important, I think, when it comes to um, new technologies, because whenever we see new technologies introduced, we always see um, you know, different kinds of alarms being raised about privacy concerns, security concerns, or other types of issues. And um, actually, our, our think tanks were coming up with um, a, a media study that we did, actually looking at some of the different um, analysis reporting over privacy issues and other tech concerns over time. And one really interesting thing that I think we've just noticed as a trend is that there's this kind of uh, vicious cycle with the media. Um, and I think this kind of is a, a reinforcing um, issue for consumers. So, you know, there's a a new technology that comes out and, and someone says, well, what about the privacy concerns? Um, and then reporters go and write about that issue and people read about it. And then uh, Pew goes and polls them and, <laughs> and you know, all these people have read these articles so they have these concerns. And then uh, you know, the reporters say, the editors say, well, you know, people are concerned about this issue, we better write more about it. Uh, and so it's this kind of vicious cycle where people hear more about the issue and they become more concerned. And of course, you know, the end result of this isn't that uh, necessarily we have to come up with a law. In many cases, you know, time simply passes and people come to realize that the concerns they had were never realized and, and they move on to another issue or the technology develops um, or they find that there's a trade-off involved and, and they're okay with that trade-off and that's what we see in, in many cases. Um, when, you know, uh, I was looking at this panel and the description of it, uh, the description of this panel was kind of billed as, you know, kind of uh, the future is now. Um, and so, you know, we can kind of look back. I was, I was thinking back of some of the um, different technologies that we've seen even discussed at Say the Net, you know, over the past 10 years. And if you go back to around 2004, 2005, RFID was the number one issue, right? Everyone was talking about RFID and RFID privacy. Um, and if you weren't around then, you might think, I'm crazy, and that, that didn't actually happen, but it did happen. You know, people were talking about RFID, RFID being the mark of the beast, that you know, maybe this was this kind of biblical end of times um, for privacy. And you know, if you go now and you look at what's going on, you know, there wasn't really any inter uh, legislation introduced in the past few years about RFID. It hasn't really been a big issue in Congress, and most people move on from this. Um, I don't even know when the last time Pew asked in the survey about RFID because it just isn't a, a big issue anymore. And so I think when we approach legislation like this for new technologies, when we're talking about the Internet of Things, when we're talking about data analytics, we have to take these consumer perceptions with the same kind of grain of salt. We have to remember that the context matters, that time matters, that over time a lot of these issues uh, dissipate. And you know, when they don't, that's when there's time for legislation, when there's an issue that remains. You know, if we were still talking about RFID 10 years later and the technology hadn't changed, the concerns hadn't changed, and now we could point to specific harms, yeah, that's when we should step in and do something. So what is the best approach in the meantime? Just to wait or to? Yeah, no, I think the best approach in the meantime is to do two things. One, to you know, really spend a lot of time trying to identify where there are harms. I mean, you don't want to find out that there's been a harm that's been going on for 10 years. So you want to really focus on that. And two, you want to look at issues where um, you know, there are uh, existing laws and legislation that maybe need to be strengthened. Um, you know, we talk a lot about discrimination, for example, in the data context. And you know, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in um, you know, proposals to, to strengthen that. But while we're having conversations about broad-based policies to address privacy, I think that distracts from you know, meaningful progress that we can actually make um, to actually fight discrimination. So if we're talking about you know, things that actually impact people, you know, let's talk about uh, anti-revenge porn laws. You know, let's talk about INDA and you know, uh, fighting discrimination for uh, employment. Um, for gays and lesbians. I mean, these are opportunities of legislation that we could pass now that would actually have tangible impact. And I think that's, you know, pushed off the agenda because people want to talk about these broader privacy issues where there's really not as compelling a reason to act. 
Well, Michelle, I'm going to turn to you as an advocate um, for consumers, okay. but someone who also understands innovation and is trying to find the right balance. Um, when is the right time to, well, I, I guess I would say, I, I hear from CDT often talking about what I might dub careful innovation, mm -hmm. um, where privacy by design and a number of process issues are, are included in the privacy equation for industry, but still focused on, on innovation. So when is the right time to legislate, to have self-regulation, or for technology to come in? Uh, we've heard a couple perspectives. Sure. What's yours? Okay, um, well, first I'd like to address just a few things that Daniel said, um, because um, while I understand your perspective, I feel like if you said to the millions of Americans that have suffered data breach and, and identity theft because of that, where's the harm? I think you might have a different answer. And I think for me, the, the vicious cycle begins at these d data breaches, you know, that have just become ubiquitous every single day. And, you know, I think the media hasn't even reported on all of them, to be quite honest. So, you know, there is tangible harm even beyond identity theft. And part of the reason privacy is such a difficult thing to advocate for is trying to make that message palatable to people, um, to kind of connect it to their real lives. For example, when I say to people, you know, a mobile device is a small tracking device. You know, it sort of changes your view of this personal snuggly, you know, that you have next to you at night and that you, you know, take with you everywhere on field trips. But it, it's it's definitely, um, I think, not without harm because privacy is a principle. It is a basic human necessity and a basic human right. And I think that isn't always easy to explain when you use you know, bullet points like what's the harm or you try to quantify something like a human right. Um, we at CDT have been able to do that very well by breaking down issues, um, you know, kind of based on technologies, based on um, different um, sectors like surveillance, like free expression and consumer privacy. Um, you know, the government's role, we think, in this debate is to be a good steward, basically to you know, protect individual principles around privacy by using something called the Fair Information Practice Principles, or the FIPS. Um, you know, it's kind of been around for a long time. It's a time-tested um, set of principles that include things like transparency, accountability. I'm sure you guys have heard it a million times today. But the reason we go back to it is because it works. Um, it, it's really flexible and nimble, and it, it's amazing how so many different technologies that come and go still are responsive to things like the FIPS. Um, you know, so we think one thing that has been missing in the government um, sort of dialogue about this is leadership. You know, I was really glad to hear the president talk about consumer privacy legislation, and I look forward to reading that. But you know, in the past, there's really been sort of a lack of anybody in the government to stand up. In the, in the Congress in particular, um, there have been a few key leaders, but really no cohesive voice. And that astounds me as a consumer advocate because it really is bipartisan in the fact that your data can be taken. Your data can be taken. How much are you willing to share? You know, I think one thing about Lee's point that I found interesting was the idea that people are confused. And I think that's very true, partly because we're so used to curating our data, right? So it's not like everything on Facebook is some kind of realistic image, let's say, of your life. You put the good pictures up. I know I do. You know, I put the cute pictures of my kids, not when they're screaming. So, you know, we're curating a gallery of what we want our lives to look like, but the key ingredient to that curation is choice and control. So when people find out via media all of a sudden that, guess what? A lot of data is going places that you're not controlling. It's very confusing to know, you know exactly what the environment it is, and so much of that is so opaque. So the government can step in, in, in on several of those points and make that change, and I think that's important. Um, the only thing I would add to the, to the government's role um, and to the president's um, rollout in particular is that it didn't address government surveillance. And I think from CDT's perspective, from many people's perspective, that um, without that... Uh, reform, any kind of privacy reform is woefully inadequate. Do you want to speak just a little bit to when technology or self-regulation makes sense as well? Sure. I'm sure Dan Daniel and I will have lots to say about that. Um, you know, so I think for the most part we feel like anything that is technology specific or restrictive is a bad idea. Pretty much everybody, I think, would agree with that point. Um, the rules have to be in place, and that's why we kind of look to something like the FIPS and something that can be applied to these different scenarios, right, over time. Um, I think 
the key FIP for me is to bring out in terms of self-regulation is accountability. So, you know, without that kind of accountability, in other words, where companies aren't kind of, you know, trying to figure out, first of all, putting the onus on companies to figure out these complex data regimes seems unfair to me. You know, a lot of them have kind of struggled with that, and that doesn't even seem to be a fair ask, and that's part of why I think the government needs to step in. But self-regulation, um, it has so many mixed m motivations that companies just aren't compelled to police themselves. And, and it makes sense, right? Good actors get punished for being transparent about their data practices. Um, and ultimately, I don't think consumers win. When there's baseline privacy legislation that addresses security and privacy violations and has that built-in accountability, say from the FTC, an agency that has, has built the expertise to be able to do it well, um, I think that's a far better outcome for consumers. I, uh, I want to turn it over to Anne to maybe comment on that point, but also Anne is an operational um, whiz, so she's got to figure out how to make all of these policies work in the wild. And so she may have something to say about what works and what doesn't in terms of public policy that oftentimes is created with the best of intentions here in DC and sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So um, if you could address that and then maybe the privacy challenges that you see in industry um, coming your way. So California is definitely, uh, well, Silicon Valley, I don't know if I'd call it the wild exactly, but uh, it's not Washington, that's for sure. Um, so I want to start out by saying I don't have um, a playbook or any specific answers, so my answers are probably going to be it depends, and I'm not sure. These are really hard questions, really difficult to answer. I've been doing it for over 15 years, and I think we've been having essentially the same conversation for most of that time, um, which is great as an employment strategy for privacy people, um, but <laughs> for the most part, it feels like it's a little bit Groundhog's Day over and over and over again. So I wanted to comment, not to embarrass our hosts today, but the title of our presentation here is, Can We a Framework to Safeguard Americans' Commercial Privacy? And I want to say, yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, uh, but it feels like the right thing to say. So two things come to mind, just listening to some of the panelists here and some of what we brought. And I think we're gonna have a lively discussion about this, absolutely. Two things is that um, we're asking a lot of consumers and we're asking a lot of, of businesses and, and particularly of entrepreneurs and small businesses. On the consumer side, I'm struck, I read a headline, I don't know, it was probably some clickbaity thing I saw on Facebook that talked about GMO labeling because a lot of my friends on Facebook are all about GMO labeling. But the thing was actually, the article said, 80% of Americans surveyed would support labeling food that contains DNA. Um, you know, I think all that reveals to me is that a lot of people don't know what they need to know to make a decision. And yet we, we base this whole model of notice and choice, that we're gonna give consumers notice and they're gonna make an informed choice and that's gonna make it all better, but that assumes that they understand the implications of the choice they're being asked to, made, to make and that they understand enough about uh, the trade-offs that are inherent in that. And you know, when we look back at the, what we ref affectionately refer to as the summer of Snowden, the one thing I thought was very useful about that is that it did raise awareness on the parts of a lot of individuals out there who never really comprehended how much information was being collected and by whom. I thought in general it was, from, from the standpoint of education, I thought it was a very useful thing. Um, but I'm not entirely sure it changed behaviors as a result very much. And I don't know that it could have or would have, but. But at the end of the day, it struck me as, as interesting that, that that was one of the things that, uh, is how little things actually wound up changing as a result of that. The one, um, to the point that Daniel made earlier about Steve Jobs, I, I know we like to give Steve Jobs a lot of credit, but I'm, I think actually that, you know, the, the, the actual quote or the, the genesis of the notion of asking consumers what they want goes back to Henry Ford. Henry Ford said, if you ask consumers what they want, they would have said a faster horse, right? So you can't put that much on the consumer. They, they really can't predict the future. They really don't know yet what they need. Um, on the entrepreneurial side, I'll say uh, this morning, hearing um, uh, Chairman Ramirez talking about uh, ad what her advice to entrepreneurs would be and to people building these products, I wrote down a couple of notes. She said they should conduct risk assessments and they should be very, and they should be all about data minimization. And I thought, I don't know very many entrepreneurs who just got a round of funding seed financing for their new startup that are actually out there conducting risk assessments on their products. I couldn't name one that is. Um, they're thinking about building a product, 
that will get as many users as quickly as they can. Maybe they're thinking of their exit strategy and how they're gonna sell this thing for X billions of dollars in 10 months, in which case they're not thinking about data minimization. They're thinking exactly the opposite. How do I monetize the hell out of this thing? How do I make a lot of money? How do I, how do I become that next 23 year old billionaire? And data minimization is probably not their path to that end. So I'm not sure that their incentives are naturally aligned with what regulators would expect of those companies. Uh, I'm not saying that that's, I'm not, I'm not making a judgment on that particularly. I'm just saying that realistically, um, people are not looking at that problem. They're looking at building the product that's gonna be awesome. And consumers, even when they think about which products to use, they're often not thinking about these questions of what happens to that data and who's it gonna be available to. They're thinking, wow, this is a kick-ass product. I really like it, I'm gonna use it. Um, the decision-making model is generally much more short-term than the sorts of questions and things that we think about as policymakers and as policy practitioners. Um, so there are no answers in that, just problems perhaps that will guarantee our future employment and that we will discuss this again at length next year at this conference. So. <laughs> I, don't know I guess it's, a, helpful, it's a positive sign that at least one startup has someone like you thinking about these issues and trying to address them. Well, I so. like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have a very different uh, model. I can talk a little bit about more what, about what we do at, at Slack, um, but it's it's uh, it is a very different world I'm operating in now on the con on the enterprise side than on the consumer facing a little bit. So mm -hmm. it's been an interesting transition. Well, I want to turn to John, who has had the um, perhaps unenviable um, job of trying to bring all these diverse viewpoints together without necessarily taking a position, kind of helping this organic stew um, come to a bubble and come out with some regulatory um, suggestions or voluntary guidelines through the multi-stakeholder process. So I'd love for you, John, to talk a little bit about how that works, whether you see it as an alternative to um, other legislation, obviously the president and the administration have come out with a package of legislative proposals as well, but where does it make sense to do this, which is an innovative um, approach by the government, and when does it make sense to, to legislate? Sure, absolutely. So, so first let me say that, that the idea of someone convening a multi-stakeholder process to develop you know, voluntary standards around digital economy issues or internet issues or technology issues um, is not something that we at NTIA came up with. Um, th this has, a, as folks know, this has a long history um, that is deeply embedded in both the technical infrastructure and the policy inf infrastructure of the internet we use every day. The Internet Engineering Task Force, the W3C, any number of other multi-stakeholder multi organizations have been making decisions by consensus about critical issues that have kept the internet open and transparent and secure for a very long time. Um, now, is it a perfect process? No. Is it better than most of the others? We think so. And, and one of the reasons why we think so um, is that it takes into account views of all the relevant stakeholders. You, this is not a situation where you have government bureaucrats um, sitting in either the federal government or a state government making decisions about really fast moving, um, quickly evolving, highly technical subjects. What you have are government bureaucrats um, convening the relevant folks from the technical community, the advocacy community, the industry, um, lots of other folks who have an interest in the particular topic to get together and come up with common sense solutions that work for everyone. Um, ultimately, this is different from the kind of top-down prescriptive statutory or regulatory framework that works in many other areas. And, and there are times when, when that sort of top-down prescriptive framework works. Um, in our view, uh, when you have a fast-moving industry, when you have rapidly evolving technology and business practices, looking to this multi-stakeholder model makes a ton of sense. So I was very pleased to work with a number of uh, really smart and really dedicated folks on coming up with privacy disclosures for mobile devices on really small screens um, that can provide users with better information about how apps are collecting and using data. We're currently engaging in a process um, that asks folks to create a voluntary code of conduct around commercial facial recognition 
technology. Um, and this is a model that NTIA has been following in, in you know, non-privacy areas as well. Um, the Department of Commerce has been working with folks um, through NTIA and, and USPTO to work on improvements in the DMCA notice and takedown system. Um, the Department of Energy recently uh, was able to publish a voluntary code of conduct concerning smart grid and privacy. So this is a technique that works, but it doesn't work 100% of the time. There, there's absolutely no question about that. Um, so what you really need is a dedicated group of stakeholders who are able to come together and solve practical problems uh, where they have some common ground. And when you have that situation, you have that set up, the process works really well. When you don't have that situation, you don't have that set up, it's slightly more challenging. Mm -hmm. So um, as it relates to other administration initiatives, you know, since you know, 2010, 2012, you know, a long time now, the president and the administration have said that baseline comprehensive privacy legislation is a good idea, not to replace the sectoral privacy um, statutes and regulations that exist today, but to fill the gaps between them. Um, and th that sort of baseline comprehensive legislation would build trust in the internet, would address many of the issues that, that Lee's research points to, um, would likely spur adoption of new and in innovative technologies. And that call for sort of baseline comprehensive privacy legislation is consistent with the multi-stakeholder approach because um, in the president's view and in the administration's view, comprehensive legislation should not be granular and prescriptive. It should be something that encourages companies to take reasonable steps to secure data, that takes reasonable steps to give consumers notice, um, and it asks organizations that collect and use data to take a look at the context of the collection and use and see whether or not they're providing privacy safeguards that are consistent with that context. Now, that is not something that um, will give precise answers to a question that, that someone on this panel or, or someone in the audience might pose about w you know, what someone ought to do in a very specific circumstance, but it is an approach that is much more friendly to innovation um, and takes account of the realities of technology as being very quickly moving um, and innovation as being something that you can't really predict, um, you know, that brings really unpredictable and really profound benefits to users and organizations in the United States and around the world. So clearly the intent um, of many on this panel is going to be to try to find that secret sauce, that balance for consumer protection and data innovation. Um, but I guess I would want to ask, is that really possible? Can you have both or do you have to give up one or the other um, or is one more important than the other? Is data innovation where we're headed as an economy and we're a data driven economy and therefore we need to err on that side if we're going to err, or the other way around. Is data so sensitive, it, there's so much of it in society now, it needs to be protected and we need to err on the side of that? Um, and I, uh, so I think to, 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 one of the things that strikes me is that one of the, uh, is that again, we, we talk about privacy, um, some of the things we're getting at here are security related, right? A lot of the things that have, have caused anxiety among consumers um, aren't necessarily the stated purposes that you're going to use, collect the data for, what you're going to do with it, but rather that unexpected data breach. And so when, when a data breach happens and you hear this universal call for legislation um, around security standards or what have you, in many cases, I mean, companies in that, in that particular area, their incentives are completely aligned. They don't want to have data leak out. There's no reason, I mean, and having legislation isn't necessarily going to make that go away. So, I, and I don't know, you know, that legislation actually makes it any easier if it's, because companies are looking for some degree of certainty, right? Like, tell me what I'm supposed to do, especially smaller companies, you know, they just want to know what, what am I, what do I have to do? And when you say, well, it might be this, it might be that, and I can tell you that complying with legislation can be as murky and difficult to understand as complying with a set of, of, of policy frameworks or nothing at all. I mean, it's, it's, Ultimately, what, what folks are looking for is how do you make it easier for me to make sure that I'm doing the right thing? And I don't know that there's any easy solution for any of those things um, to date. And to the point about, about whether or not, um, you know, whether there's a trade-off or the right balance, you know, the thing that struck me about the comment around data minimization is that it, it's, like, it's like basically saying no collection, minimize collection, but that also minimizes potentially the, the good things you can do. So if you have, if you 
if you put that stopgap right there, then it is going to be harder to innovate. Um, you know, it, it all comes back to this notion of accountability and about building in safeguards so that there are appropriate uses of data, not simply an edict that thou shalt not collect, because if thou shalt not collect, then there's all of this other stuff that we may not be able to do that may be incredibly valuable. So it's a little bit like saying, you know, I, I'm just asking not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and I'm not sure where that inflection point is or where that right spot is. You know, I just right. think, I think the responsible use definition would be different from a corporation standpoint than from an individual's. And I think rather than a government or a corporation, the individual should be the person to decide what's an appropriate use of their own data. You know, I think a lot of... I'm um, not sure the individual is going to necessarily be informed to the degree that they're able to make... It, it's a lot to know to be able to make that. I, I think you underestimate people a little bit. I mean, I, I do understand that things are confusing, and I, I constantly get calls from my family asking for help with their Facebook settings, which I can't do. <laughs> <laughs> Even I'm confused by them. But, um, no, I mean, I think people want to have a choice and they want to have control. A lot of companies, I think what the data minimization principle is pointing at isn't um, you know, please, no innovating, you know, we don't want to innovate. It's the just vacuuming, the drunken data vacuum that has become the internet where people collect data and, and they save it and say, well, maybe later I'm going to have a reason to use it. And so part of, one more thing, part of the data minimization principle that's really crucial is the respect for context. So part of what people when what they expect to happen when they have an online experience when they go to the internet what they expect to happen to their data you know a great example which is constantly used but it's such a good example are the flashlight apps who you know were collecting all kinds of crazy data right so the reason i use that is because it's sort of so clear but in fact there are all kinds of apps that are just you know sort of overusing a lot of data but people have really no understanding of that nor would they be you know really excited to see that something outside of what they had authorized or expected was being used. So to ask companies to, to look at those principles isn't, isn't too much of a burden, in my opinion. And I think companies are definitely willing to look at the, the principles. I think um, it's a very valid point to talk about the difference between collection and use. And that becomes very important when a company is trying to apply in the flashlight app example for to, to take that example, the data is still collected. It's a question of what are the permissible uses and are there secondary uses that in some case might make sense. So that's definitely an issue as we get it to data sharing as well. But Dan, you wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to jump in on a couple of these points. I mean, one, you know, certainly we can talk about, you know, sure, I mean, you know, you could always envision that it'd be better to give consumers a choice to opt into different things or to think through it. And there's a cost associated with that. And we have to be cognizant of the fact that there is that cost. And we need to think about what kind of future do we want and what kind of future do we expect. If we expect that, um, you know, 90% or 80% or 70% of people are going to be opting into these things and the cost of opting in is substantial, then we want to have an opt-out situation. Maybe allow 30% to opt out or 20% to opt out and make sure we're designing policy around these efficiencies so that we can gain these effic efficiencies. Um, and you know, this, to the, this gets to the question of you know, what do we expect? Is data-driven innovation important? I think it is when we look at you know, the big opportunities in areas like healthcare and areas like education. We want to see data used more and more. We're not less and less. And so we want to find the best path forward to enable that. Giving consumers lots of options for deciding how they want to share and when they want to share is probably not the best way to get to that end result. Um, I mean, we can you know, see lots of areas, organ donation, um, where more people want to donate organs than do, right? So more people would be willing to check that box to donate organs, but they don't. So this is a public policy problem. Um, but now you're multiplying that problem you know, by the you know, tens or hundreds of devices that you might have where it might be really beneficial, where most users might agree to share data under most situations. We can impose that cost on everyone, or we can find a way to do it more efficiently. And I think we want to find a way to do that really efficiently for the consumers and for the companies involved. Um, but I want to build off what Ann talked about around um, data breach notification, because I think this is you know, really important when we talk about the, you know, the difference between privacy and security. I mean, I agree with you about you know, the issue that you know, consumers um, are concerned about you know, their identity theft. And we, you know, we want things like data breach notification, but I think that's very different than these broad-based privacy regulations and legislative proposals that we've seen out there. Um, that is a, you know, it's, it's addressing a very different issue. And when you look at 
what the FTC, for example, proposed in their report on the Internet of Things that was released this morning. You know, they make that distinction. They're talking about data breach notification. That's a great thing. But then they're talking also about very broad-based privacy legislation that tries to implement FIPS. And you know, most of the FIPS were designed, you know, this was, what, the 60s and 70s. It was designed for a small data world where the idea of collecting data and using it for new purposes, that wasn't the mentality and that wasn't where innovation was occurring. If you look at data-driven innovation today, if you look at things like open data, if you look at the problems we see between countries, it's about cross-border data flows. The central issue is, can you share data so it can be used in interesting ways? And these types of regulations prevent that. Well, it's actually a great segue because the next topic I was going to raise is the Internet of Things, and the report is certainly very timely. Um, and we've heard of all sorts of examples of um, wearable technologies and uh, then appliances that you can program from afar. And it seems to me that there actually is a difference between something that you wear all the time and something that you want to just access all the time. And so it would be helpful if, um, if folks maybe discuss whether there are frameworks within frameworks that makes sense, or uh, I know that the the FTC report just came out this morning, but if anyone has um, additional comments, Dan just commented a little bit about where the FTC seems to be going on this. I don't know where the FTC is going on this. I mean, I, <laughs> or I the, the difference there in There were them. some comments on it this morning, I think. Um, I, so I think, uh, to my earlier point, it depends, right? A lot of wearables are getting to um, actual health information, which can be incredibly useful. This is where I, where I think a lot about the value of, of what the product or service is to the consumer. What, what actual benefit am I getting out of it? And I think most consumers are really looking at things from the lens of what, how is this useful to me? I'm making a decision to use this product because I think this product is awesome and it has all these benefits for me. They're often not thinking through all of the secondary and tertiary possible uses of the, all of that data. And I don't actually disagree with Michelle on data minimization to the extent that I, I think there has to be some reasonableness to it. I just think also, I've talked with a lot of advocates in the privacy space that I shall not name here who are very um, fundamentalist about it, right? About if you have no explicit upfront, absolutely, you know, demonstrable need for this one piece of data in a way that is then never ever and I think that you know there may be some there may be a little more wiggle room in that with with Internet of Things the challenge is you can't really give meaningful notice when you have no interface when you have you know no when it's when it's uh, ubiquitous and just always on and monitoring your house or monitoring your vitals there are incredible benefits to that and again we just it, it always comes down to the hard the hard part is, is, right, is approaching this from the standpoint of maximize the benefits, minimize the harms, because those things are different for everything. Um, and that model is not easy, and it's not easy to, to create a verifiable audit around that. Uh, and we want certainty, and we want it to be simple, and it really isn't, which is why we keep having the conversation. And one of the things that uh, Chairman Ramirez said this morning was that we need to innovate in terms of how do we interface with the customer. Um, if you're interfacing with your appliance, there is a screen somewhere, you're setting settings somewhere. Um, not so with your sock or, or potentially your wristband or potentially something that's sewn into your clothing well, can I just or sensors. There's, so I, I actually um, take pictures of funny notices that I see. Today's funny notice was in the ladies' room where the sign says, check your flush. You know, did you see that in the ladies' room? Like, I ch check your whatever it was like I thought that was hysterical my boss uh, took a picture of a urinal I know it sounds like we're bathroom obsessed but it was literally it was a sign in the bathroom in Canada that said it was this long sign that said we're so sorry but this tr this, tr this urinal is broken please don't use it it's like it doesn't have to be that hard don't pee here you know it's like it's broken <laughs> so sometimes we make this a lot harder than it has to be but in many cases it's just hard you know it is just hard because there's nowhere to so we have to think through this in an entirely different way, I think. And we, I, I, I actually would, would say that we just need to burn the house down and build it up again. We're trying to, we're just trying to come at this from the edges, and it feels to me like incrementalism is just going to be painful here. Sorry. Go Wait, ahead. you had a <laughs> comment. <laughs> um, Michelle is right that context matters a lot, and who, who's making the decision matters a lot. And so it's really hard to make policies that have bright lines when people draw bright lines at different places. And there are two ways that we're learning this uh, with sort of newer data uh, very immediately now. We're doing focus groups that are trying to walk people through scenarios of whether they would give up information in return for, for certain kinds of benefits. 
And what is a consistent finding is no matter where people draw the line, and one example we're, we're asking about is like a nest-like uh, thermostat. And different people would draw the line at different places. Some people say, uh, under no circumstances would I want my thermostat to know when I'm in the room or out of the room or things like that, when I'm home or not. Other people are comfortable with that because they can control it remotely and have all sorts of energy saving benefits and things like that. What freaks everybody out, no matter where they draw the line, is, is if there's an add-on to the original agreement that they don't anticipate. So I signed up for this deal, you've offered me this deal, and all of a sudden if I'm getting extra stuff flooding into my life that I didn't think I signed up for, that's what consistently irritates them and puts them over the edge on this. So that's how they um, uh, sort of draw a line and, and don't want to move over it. If, if it brings extra stuff into their life, they're not happy. But there are also the circumstances under which they will expand the line. And some classic examples relate to health information and, and even specifically in clinical trials. If you ask people to share their data for insurance companies, um, in many cases they won't or they, don't, they want real tight restrictions on it because it's precious data, they know how it can come back to harm them at least theoretically. But if the ask also includes uh, information about how this can help the research community solve problems with the diseases or treatment conditions that they're under, the number of, uh, of people who will agree to those circumstances is considerably higher. They're altruistic. They want to actually have their data be helpful. They don't want it siloed in ways that will restrict some of the best analytics that can, that can be brought to bear on them. And so, again, sort of the specific ask and the specific element of the bargaining with them is often an inducement to them to give more than they might have thought that they would give at the opening of the conversation. John? So, Lee, th this is a really interesting data point, and it's something that comes up anecdotally in a lot of conversations that, w that we have with industry and with research folks and, and across the board, right? And it's the difference between um, taking data and using it to perform analysis and then create what, what I try to think of as like general rules of application, right? So in the health context, you, you could analyze data and discover, oh, um, X particular um, data point is a marker for Y condition. And folks seem to be very comfortable by and large with that sort of idea, um, even though they understand that down the road that sort of research may not help them because they may not end up with Y condition, it may just help somebody else. Um, and they understand that down the road that if they do come down with Y condition, um, that data point is going to have a, a probably really complicated impact on issues like insurance and treatment and outcomes and everything else, right? So folks tend to seem okay with that. It's when you start to collect or use or analyze data in ways to make decisions about specific individuals, right? Not to develop rules of general application mm -hmm. that folks seem to have a, a little bit of a, a of more reticence to it. I mean, is that is that a fair way to think yeah, about it? Yeah, that's a nice, that's, that's very nice. It, it, the altruism piece kicks in uh, if it's used for general purposes. Uh, I, there's also, I think there's some confusion. Um, I think that in fact there's a lot of confusion about health privacy. I think most people think that HIPAA covers it, and it doesn't. Um, certainly with wearables, we've been looking at that a lot this year. Just um, the information that flows through wearables is mostly outside of HIPAA, which means it's unregulated, um, which means, you know, that there are some questions about how it should be used and by whom. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that you're referring to, John, is health scores. Um, and those exist, and that's another thing I think most people may not be aware of. I certainly wasn't before I started doing this work. But there are scores about most of us that are based on health information that's outside of HIPAA for the most part. But may, in fact, some of it may even be in. Um, but it's, it's sort of inference type things. Like a, you, your um, pharmacy may share your drug history, which is a list of drugs, but is actually also a pretty accurate description of your health, the state of your health, and what sorts of things you're being treated for. And if you combine that with, say, when you went to a doctor, maybe that's from a mobile device, maybe that's from a fitness app, um, you have a, also a pretty good picture of the sort of health that you're in. And you know, most people aren't really comfortable with sharing that, but may inadvertently be doing it. Um, I think when you go to the Internet of Things, just to tie those two, it's not unreasonable to expect that there may be, you know, house scores or appliance scores or scores that are related to how you interact inside your home. And I think, you know, again, the thing about having the Internet be somewhere else, and I think people feel sort of sense of security about that, that perhaps they shouldn't, but when it's in your home, I think, and I'm hoping in a way that people are more aware of the fact that, you know, this is, this is a place that is going to be monetized. And that's the point of the Internet of Things, well, for the I, most part. The, the, 
so two points I wanted to make. One is uh, when we think about things like uh, the Nest device or some of the more popular or, or examples of the Internet of Things, one of the things that I think uh, does become potentially problematic, and this comes up all the time the when we talk about the combination of data, is that if I'm, if I'm sharing information with Nest, I might be perfectly okay with that. Uh, if Nest is part of Google and Google has all this other data, it's, it's that concern of all of the combination of data that I think uh, and the uses thereof that become murky for consumers and, and start to raise questions. And I know a lot of these large organizations, having worked for them in the past, have really great teams thinking through these problems, but it is, it is unprecedented the number of enormous organizations that have enormous amounts of data about consumers. And that is something that, you know, it is, it does give me pause. Uh, you know, it does give me pause, and it, it probably should. Well, right? it's part of the equation, for sure, in data sharing in this point about um, what did the consumer agree to is quite important when you then try to place innovation on top of that. So you might think about a rudimentary map uh, app that originally tells you what your route is, and over time tells you what um, alternative routes you could have, what your traffic's like, are there restaurants on your route, are there gas stations on your route. Same data is being used to provide you different things. And so it's, it's important, uh, that may not be the best example of, of when the fundamental um, decision or, or agreement is, you may think it's great to have um, new aspects of, of a mapping technology, but you may not think that that's okay, and certainly there have been companies that have crossed that line as they've tried to improve their products. Um, and there's a lot of pressure, I think, to do that, certainly in the wearable space. I know, you know, a great example, um, there have been studies that shown that people get really excited about their Fitbit and their jawbone for like a week. <laughs> and then you forget it or whatever happens, it, you know, so there's a large drop off. And I think that that is an important um, frame to, when you look at even things with the inter products and the internet of things. Not everything is going to succeed. I don't really need a smart toaster, you know, I just need it to toast and, you know, whatever's happening inside of it. Although I did see a clear toaster, that which was really, really cool. <laughs> but I don't need it to think or anything. Um, but the, you know, the, the, so what has happened with wearables, for example, is with this drop off rates, the companies have tried to monetize. So they've started doing more data like health, your heart rate, um, your blood pressure. So that pressure on the, um, on the sort of industry, I think, makes the even stronger call for there to be government, you know, reasonable rules of the road for industries. And I'd like Lee to comment a little bit on, you know, you, you, you get these results from your wearable and you post them, mm -hmm. or a lot of people do, or they share their results, and there may be different gradations here, but what are consumer attitudes, and is there a little bit of schizophrenia, really, on, I'm, I'm concerned about other sharing, but I'm perfectly happy to put everything out there on my own. And, and then if it's public, somebody else can find it. So it it's, might be helpful to get. Well, it just gets back to the first point I made about privacy not being binary. People understand that they're sharing data, shedding data, and, and, and it's being used in a variety of ways. And, and in some cases, they're pretty comfortable with uh, the bargain related to that. The New York Times, the business section of the New York Times actually did some wonderful research about the mentality of sharing, what's going on, and they um, they found that about two thirds of internet users like the act of sharing because it builds trust with the people that they're dealing with, especially close friends. It builds community even with with strangers in their lives, and something nice happens to them when they're uh, when they're letting things out in the world. We just did a piece, of, we just released a piece of work about uh, social media use and the cost of caring. And one of the things that it built off was a lot of social science findings that the very act of sharing information, even if it's not very pleasant information, somehow relieves a little bit of the burden of life, especially for women. So there's a lot of evidence that this network life is a life that has a lot of encouragement to share information, and you get a whole bunch of good things out of it. As at the same time, those same imperatives to share are uh, pushing people to you know, maybe disclose more than they want or to be put in positions where they don't have a choice. About a fifth of the um, workers in this country, their jobs depend on them being available and visible online. So they, they're not able to opt out of that. I think it's the opacity, too, of, of the data collection that makes it hard for people to really weigh that, that scenario. For example, if you ask those same women who enjoyed sharing pictures of their kids, if they knew that their kids were tagged by facial recognition and stored in a database, how they would feel about that, the answer might be very different. 
One other um, issue I just want to raise before we get to questions from the audience, just to, to finish up right um, at five, because we're standing between you and the drinks literally against <laughs> the wall or on the other side of the wall, um, would be just to raise a couple of issues about location data. And I couldn't um, have this panel go forward without um, mentioning location data. It's certainly a focus that we're seeing more and more from Congress, um, where you are, and um, near field communications is another piece of that. Uh, marketers are very interested in knowing what people are doing in their stores, uh, the combination of in-store and out-of-store activity in terms of giving people offers, et cetera. So um, can you maybe just, can, if anyone would like to speak to this, the different approaches um, should there be different approaches for real-time data, past data versus real-time data or, or the combination of, of data? Um, I think, uh, well, I just want to say I love Waze. <laughs> it saved my life more than once. I think actually your, your example of Google Maps and, and Waze um, and mapping technology in general is one of the most powerful examples of the benefit of crowdsourcing that sort of information. Right, and I think um, there are so many benefits of location-based data collection and use that have real tangible beneficial impacts to end users that I think we all agree that it should not, it, it shouldn't be capped forever, but it's that secondary use, it's that what are you gonna do with it in an individually identifiable way. If I'm one anonymous little pink car on a map um, I'm fine with that, but you know, if you're gonna, if, but every time I watch an episode of Law and Order, um, I'm always struck that the, it's always it always comes back to the fast track thing in the car, and you know, and, and knowing that they were there at a certain time, and that's not government use of data. Government <laughs> use of data, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so you know, thank you, Edward Snowden, for for <laughs> informing the world about more of that. I think that was actually very helpful. But I I just I can't think of another example of where there are more tangible benefits. Uh, available to me than perhaps that. That's been one of the most useful to me personally. So, I did see one question from the audience at least. No, and I'm happy to talk about this too. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I've got just an awful lot of like to point to thank you so for the position. Sure. You really brought to a point that was discussed, which is while well, we're here in the real world discussing this, there's an underbelly that's doing it also, and the laws that we abide by, the underbelly or the underworld does not abide by. And it was ways that was used to track the two cops, so I'm not happy there. But data gathering actually precedes Google. I'm doing a paper trail on an entity, and we've been cached for years and years. My biggest objection is how my brand, et cetera, has been dissipated. And every time I go online, I find new entities that have multiple different variations of me. And I look at that as a state-by-state -state violation of rights of publicity and rights of privacy. So while we're looking at the world on a global or the country's a national level, we need to start fighting back, I think, on a state-by-state -state level. So one, I don't know if there's a question in there, when you talk about the underbelly, are you talking about the mafia or the government? Um, the <laughs> nefarious. I'm I, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm well, one I mean, that I'm actually. Seriously, I want. I'm not. No, no, no. I, 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 I you are. Um, I, I'm still pulling back on data on that, where I've gone to elements that are nefarious, not necessarily the mob. People that are curious start to look into something and see the positive, not the negative, and. Hence, we've now got the battle with ICANN going on. There's different arguments. Some see it's great because they're going to benefit, and others see that it's horrible because how it's allowed other um, dominoes to, to fall into place. So um, just it was points being made. Um, you and Michelle did raise points of this is something to slow down about. But how do we pull back? Can we ever pull back from where we are now? Because it's not a very good position we're in. You know, I think um, that's a very good point, and I think honestly, I have lots of friends on you know all sides of this issue. But I'll, many times, I'll hear industry folks saying, uh, putting putting this frame on the on the on data you know topics as though it's this runaway train that you know like the NTIA can't catch it, no one can catch it. We gotta you know run after the, all these crazy issues. When in fact, I don't think that's the case. I think you know you're right. Data collection is nothing new, and in fact, we have a lot of laws, federal laws, also state laws, 
that address certain issues that really come up when you when you talk about ubiquitous data collection. For example, discriminatory practices. You know, I think near field communication to me, you know, you can't disconnect it from mobile, which you can't disconnect from location, which you can't disconnect from things like data points like zip code. Um, you know, which do matter and do make decisions about you, um, whether or not it's marketing or whether it's getting, you know, offered a predatory loan or a different kind of loan rate. Um, you know, these aren't just wild-eyed examples. These are actual things that are happening now that can be fixed by having laws address, you know, there's a whole patchwork of laws that address um, certain mobile payment kind of marketing, like Graham Leach Bliley, but they don't really cover this area. They don't really cover near field communications and some of those relationships that you have with a vendor are so complex that, you know, even gauging what a consumer's expectation might be is very difficult. Um, you know, but for example, here's a great example that I think about a lot. You have somebody from a poor neighborhood who goes to a CVS. CVS uses digital signage. They use retail analytics to ping your phone and see where you've gone around the store. Um, they look at that and see which promotions you've stayed at for a long time. They can marry this information with your rewards card, with your drug history, right? So you see how these things, when they start to come together, become problematic. But if there are stops in place, and there are for health, right, and it works for the most part, if there are stops there for financial information, certain types of marketing to you, and when you're not when you don't have a relationship with a vendor, there are stops there for, the, for what can be sent to you and how your data can be used. That can also happen here. It just, it needs um, industry and advocates and all the stakeholders to really work together to pass laws. I, I love the idea of that, but as a practical matter and to the point, the question of, you know, can we slow this down? Is there, can we pull this back? Technology and the pace of innovation is accelerating. It's not receding, it's not slowing. Um, it is already well ahead of the law. We can try to fill gaps, but realistically, we're never going to get ahead of it. Um, and you know, there is that concern about innovation cycling, which I know we go back and forth on. But I think it's unrealistic to think that we're going to be able to address each and every one of these things on a case-by-case -case basis. We have to have a flexible approach, because technology is well ahead of all of us right now. To what extent is technology part of the solution? It has to be part of the solution. I think the innovation that we're talking about is in that area as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? Oh, I was going to talk about, well, green consumerism. Is there something akin to that in privacy? So, um, you know, have the right to be forgotten after you're, you know, okay, I've used this for five years. It's been useful for me. Now I want to wipe out all my data. Um, so yes, we like to have control over our data for, for sure. Or competition um, within the competition. different companies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it exists. <laughs> but um, at, to Lee's point, sometimes it can be hard to find um, the ability to keep your identity to yourself is very, it can be difficult. Uh, but there are all sorts of programs to allow you to do it. Yes, Adam. I am Adam Thier with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. I've been reading the FTC's, been reading the FTC's new Internet of Things report today, and I'm wondering if someone can help me reconcile this seeming inconsistency in the report, which is that it, it spends a lot of time, uh, starting right on page one, hand-wringing uh, about all the growth of the Internet of Things, all the new things that are connected to the Internet, and the resulting potential privacy and security implications because of the speed with which we're adopting these new technologies. It then, without missing a beat, says that we need to have new congressional legislation and regulation on this front because if not, consumers won't trust the Internet of, Internet of Things enough to adopt it. <laughs> Can somebody explain to me how those two things are reconciled and why that's a rationale for regulation? I want to commend your ability to turn that into a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounded like a... Comment. Um, do you want to say? I it? won't. I feel like I'm taking oh, over. Go, go for ahead. It. No, no, you. Your space more than Okay. Um, I, I, I've only briefly read it, um, and I, you know, it seemed to be um, offering good, sound advice and recommendations to companies on this. The speed of innovation and the fact that consumers may or may not adopt it, I think, is 
the only thing I can say there. Um, you know, just because a company makes it doesn't mean they will come, right? It doesn't mean that I want that smart toaster that's probably in development somewhere. So I think that's part of it. I think um, somebody needs to show me where, where this speed ticker is because, you know, I realize that there's a lot of innovation, but there's always a lot of innovation. Privacy is an innovation. You know, there's a lot of innovation to be done in the privacy space. Um, I think people forget that the internet, you know, there was a time, and this ages me, ages is me, but there was a time when nobody would go online to buy things because it wasn't secure, and it was it was almost ridiculous to think of doing that. So, I mean, I think where the innovation speed needs to be maybe shifted a little bit is in how do we create a scenario where people can feel like they have control and actually do. So, one example, I wish that the FTC had maybe included the idea that there could be a data aggregator that's involved in the Internet of Things where somebody could, you know, sort of piece their data from different places, from different things, and um, have one area where they can make choices about how it's shared and with whom, and that they have a, a way to control that. I think that would have been maybe a, a better way to pose the, the problematic idea of all these different technologies developing so quickly. And there are certain companies that are trying to do that um, to the earlier questioner's point of, of curating your own brand online and your own data. Um, oh, Lee, did you want to? Okay. Um, last question. Uh, that's just a great idea. And I mean, how many times have I filled out my health information and every single doctor is all the same information? Um, so in so many ways, an aggregator um, is a big boon. Um, efficiency, um, accuracy of my data, um, and you know, out of control for you know, um, it might be surprising what one person's uh, decision of sharing versus not sharing. I mean, that's unique to the. I think particularly in health, you know, and we made this point of something about you know research and the different reasons why people sharing health and community online. Um, yeah, I think it's a very different scenario. Just, uh, and, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, just a final thought. I mean, I, I think in most of these cases, I mean, consumers are in favor of these technologies and data sharing or any of these things when, when they're made better off. And, and they're only saying that they don't want to share when they think something bad will happen to them. And that's why it's important, I think, to have these targeted focused rules that say, you know, this type of bad thing will happen to you. So, you know, you uh, can't not get a job because you're pregnant. It doesn't matter if you show up to the job and someone thinks you're pregnant or predictive analytics say you're pregnant or there's a data breach and that information gets out. The point is this type of action is not allowed. And I think that's, you know, consumers want to have trust in what people can do and feel that, you know, things are getting better for them. I just, and that, I wanted to make one last point, which is that I don't, we talk about the internet as if it's this monolithic thing and we ask consumers about the internet and about the internet of things and about their trust in this monolithic thing. I don't have trust in any monolithic thing, but I have trust in a lot of very specific brands. And as a consumer, I make decisions on a case by case basis. And so I think it's a little bit, to me, it feels very incongruous to ask about this big thing um, when people are actually, I think, making decisions on a daily basis on little things, little, like, is this giving me value? Am I right. getting something out of this? And, and that was kind of the last point that, that I was going to end the panel on. It really is, com it comes back to the value, to the consumer. Are you giving them convenience? Are you giving them value? Are you making their life easier? And those are the types of technologies that tend to succeed. And we may not be able to predict what a consumer may want or need, or we may all have I different ideas about what we want or need. But if you're using the data for that useful purpose, that is going to solve a lot of these problems as well. Not, not in a vacuum, not without some other structures, but. Um, that, that's kind of one of the things to take away as well, whether you're a company or, or a developer or a consumer. Thank you. Oh, yes, and tomorrow is Data Privacy Day, so don't. National Data Privacy Day. <laughs>